Live from our Boston headquarters, this is Cyba on Display. In-depth conversations on marketing tips, trends, and strategies. Here's your host, Derek Sullivan. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Cyba on Display. Uh, joining me today is Michael Norris. Michael is the CMO of UTech. Um, for those that don't know, UTech is a full service digital and traditional marketing agency based out of Chicago. Uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so this is a big moment, man. You, uh, you are the first to be on video for us. Oh man, I, I you know we're in between moving offices right now, so I normally have a much cooler background. But I guess uh, I guess this will do, right? It's not is, terrible. Is that your off? That's your apartment or office? This is my office. This is my oh, office. okay, gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. I like the money tree in the background there. Thank you. I, I'm yeah. happy you recognize it was a money tree. Yeah, right. I know my plants, especially my indoor plants. You know, being a city guy, I don't have much room for a uh, actual, you know, growing outside. So I know all about the low light indoor plants such as money trees and they're impossible to kill yeah i was gonna say if i haven't killed it yet it's uh it's it's pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah you have a serious gift if you can kill a money tree like that's what they're <laughs> known for is keeping it up so i know i spoke on your podcast um last week um mm-hmm. you know it went great just going through your episodes now it looks like you are about 25 episodes deep on you talk right, right? Yeah. um yeah. so you know, what kind of got you into doing podcasting um, just as a marketing channel for you tech? Well, first and foremost, I think, you know, as a marketing agency, marketing yourself can be a challenge because you're trying to position yourself as a marketing agency to use versus other marketing agencies and they do marketing too. So they're good at it. You know, like the competition level is high. It's not like I'm you know, some kind of HVAC company and maybe, you know, the other people in my area aren't doing too much. Like, I mean, I've got, I've got some solid competition. So given that, um, you know, all the usual channels that we do things on have been tough to, it's been tough to come by, man. Like, you know, we can run search ads and all that kind of stuff. And we have done this stuff in the past and, you know, the, it just wasn't great. Like I, I, you know, I would, I would, say it bombed kind of, you know, based on what we were looking to do. And um, then same thing goes for like SEO. I think we have some of the best SEO specialists in the world, truthfully, like we're really good at SEO. And I'm not just saying that, but when you're running SEO versus all these like huge agencies and stuff, man, it's, it's just tough. It, it's just really competitive. So um, we were looking for different ways to set ourselves apart. And one of those was a podcast. Not every agency has them. It's a space that's growing for sure, but it's not crazy saturated yet. And it was an area we felt we could make an impact. And at the same time, you know, we want to be able to personalize things to our clients and everything. And, and we want to be able to showcase ourselves and our expertise and all that and show that we're real people. And a podcast is a great channel to do it, especially when you have video like this going to, mm-hmm. I, I think it's great. You know, people can see the, the man behind the mask and all that. And they can see what you're all about, what you think. So whenever they're ready to buy, they trust you a little bit. You know, they've listened to your stuff. It's less touch points. They understand who they're getting involved with. And so the podcast seemed like a a good extension from that. And it's been great so far. We got some great reviews. That's great. You know, like you said before, and it's very true, podcasts are becoming more and more popular, especially with company, with marketing companies. Um, You know, if you search, through Spotify, you'll see tons that come up. Yeah. It looks like you guys kind of, you know, got got in early, right? You kind of beat the curve, if you will. Um, what are some ways that you market your podcast? Um, and in doing so, are there any real direct ways for seeing that maybe not ROI, but to see results, to see whether they're performing well or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I've been asked this numerous times. And truthfully, I've gotten um, my strategies from others who've done it before me. And so I know I know that it works. But uh, so I'll be taking notes. then. Yeah, please. tell me. So, um, you know, when we started, I'll be honest, I mean, we just kind of started we didn't have like a, a really solid direction. But nobody really listens to your first couple episodes anyway. 
what I started to do was at first I would bring in, you know, whoever I could get as a guest. And I was just trying, you know, I was going out there. I, I made like a recurring task for myself to reach out to people, email them, message them on LinkedIn, tell them how much I like their stuff and, and ask them to come in. And at first, you know, I wasn't getting very, people like who, who didn't really have a big following, maybe, you know, truthfully, like the stuff they were bringing to the table wasn't that groundbreaking either. Um, but I've learned to level up my guests as I go. And so one of the things I've, I've been doing is I'll, I now have, you know, like some, like I've had like Rand Fishkin on, he's pretty big. Um, I've had, uh, I just had Amanda Getz on last week. That one hasn't even aired yet, but she's got like 30,000 followers on Twitter too. So I'm trying to leverage people's networks that they have to get eyes on, on me. Right. Smart. But um, in doing so, I'm asking them for um, introductions to people in their network and, you know, I do that at the end of every episode now. I say like, hey, you know, after we finish recording, I hope this has been valuable for you. It's been super valuable for me. Is there anyone else you can think of who would be good for our audience just based on like the talk today? And, and a lot of times they're like, you know, who would be good? This person. And they give me an introduction over email and then we just go from there. So it's been great. I'm like backed up now. I've, I've got too many people in the hopper who want to be guests on the show. So it's not a bad thing, that's yeah. been amazing. Um, but yeah, just leveraging their networks. You know, I, I send caption videos, video clips of people saying things on my podcast that I think would be good for them that they'd want to share with their network. I send over like three, three different clips to them via Dropbox. And I say like, hey, if you want to use these, post them on social, everything, go for it. If you don't want to do it, no pressure, no worries. And, and everyone does it. And, um, you know, they get, they get really good engagement with their network doing that. And then I'll come in in the comments and just be like, yeah, thank you. You know, if anyone wants to see more of the show or anything like that, here's where you can check it out. And that's how we've been growing. So um, we do that. And then we do emails too. Just every, every time we have a new episode, we shoot out an email, we post on our social channels. And, and I'll be honest, man, you know, my first, when I first started, I didn't have a very clear direction as to where I wanted this to go. I was like, should I interview current clients? Should I interview people who I think are potential clients and I can talk to them, have them tell their story. And then I can be like, Hey, you have some marketing services, right? None of that really transpired. Like it didn't work out, but um, to me, just, just coming and providing valuable content to people and really bringing on interesting guests is what I've seen jumpstart everything. So yeah, it's, it's totally organic. We don't spend a ton of money on it at all. Very low budget production, $60 mic. I bought a uh, backlight, which was like $10 on Amazon makes me look a little bit prettier. I don't know, I don't know how pretty go. I can get, but a little I, bit prettier. I, I have a lava lamp. <laughs> I, feel like I'm in like, I feel like I'm in a dorm room in here. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the best. Maybe I'll get one of those ring lights. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the beauty though in a, in a podcast is it's, it doesn't need to be some high budget production and it, 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 it can be quicker a lot of times than writing something, right? Like you can put all your thoughts out on paper and write it and write it and rewrite it and focus on your headline and all that. But if you're just putting out consistent podcast episodes. I mean, you and I are going to knock this out in what about an hour, and right. then you go and post it. I mean, hey, yeah. it's quick. Yeah, and then repurposing it, like you said, having those clips mm -hmm. help. You know, not everyone has time for a 30, 45 minutes, sometimes hour long podcast. So being able yeah. to really break up the important parts in the clips, throw them on your social. I love what you said about having your guest repost as well, and then introduce you to someone else that may work. Again, just kind of expanding your network. Um, do you have any like dream guests for your podcast? Is there anyone that you're like dying to get on? Ooh, man. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> I would love to have, I think, you know, like the bigger, the better, right? I'd love to have like a Gary Vion. I know that's right. like a, a dream. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. Like I'm the yeah. biggest Joe Rogan fan. I'm not saying I would have Joe Rogan on. I don't know that he'd be able to talk marketing sales and stuff, but, right. um, you know, given that just using his, his model for like how he's very versatile and brings in people of all kinds. Um, I, I, I guess just people who are like in the top of their respective niche, whatever it is that they're doing, those, right. those are kind of my dream guests, people that I can really learn groundbreaking things from because a lot of the content that's out there today, let's be honest. I mean, everyone's producing content right. really hard to break through the noise, really hard to find the good stuff. And if I can get it straight from the source and ask the questions I want to ask from people who know more than me, I'm, I'm all about that. 
Yeah, I think sometimes, you know, the best, although I haven't done many podcasts, the best ones are people that I can learn from, right? Um, yeah. But I have a genuine interest in like learning more and then like trying to grow um, from what this person is telling me. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, you are CMO of, of UTech, which is, you know, an awesome position. I can tell that you love it. You're passionate about marketing. How did you really start off? Like, what was your first job in marketing? Was it in Chicago? Was it with UTech? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go all the way back. I promise this story makes sense. I, okay. I'll go all the way back to when I was 10 years old. I didn't think at that age I wanted to do marketing, but my mom and my stepdad owned a marketing agency at that time. And so ever since I was a kid, all of our dinner conversations, you know, things like that, they revolved around marketing, business, agency life, all that kind of stuff. And so you, you know, really, you really grew up with this. This is really I like, so I, I, you, you know, like I was a teen, I went through that stage. I was like rebellious in my own sure. way and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm never going to do what you guys do. Uh, uh, uh. And I went through like, you know, I wanted to be an English teacher. I want to be a history teacher. I wanted to, then I just wanted to be an English major and write books or something. And then um, I was going to be an attorney and I got a, an internship at a family law firm. And it was like the worst thing I'd ever done. And I, at that point, I, I was majoring in philosophy and I was like, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm going to graduate with my philosophy degree. I know that doesn't prepare me for any particular career, but I'm just doing it, right? I'm getting out of college. And my parents had that agency. So they, they brought me on. They were like, we'll give you your first job out of college. We'll teach you stuff. You can go wherever you want from here, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I, I was there for about a year. I, I came in as a project manager. And luckily for me, you know, I, I was in an advantageous situation where they were teaching me things that they wouldn't normally teach someone in that role, right? right. So I was very fortunate there. Um, but I was, I was picking up all kinds of stuff. And then um, one of my friends from college, Lauren, who's our, our COO today, she just messaged me on LinkedIn one day. and was like, how much do you like your job? And we got to talking. She was telling me about UTAC. And uh, I came in for an interview, same role, project manager, everything like that. I want to say I crushed the interview. I ended up here. So, hey, I did something right. Mm -hmm. And um, I just grew from there, man. I was managing one client at the time, which was our, our second biggest client that we had. I did everything for them. So um, it was a media site. They're still a client today, by the way. It was a media site. And I was doing their social media. I was writing all the articles for them. Um, I was doing their SEO. I was doing their pay-per-click advertising. Wow. I was like doing their emails. I was doing literally everything. And some of the stuff I had never done before, but I got a crash course in it because it was like, I was in the client's office too with them. So I was talking to the client every day. And, you know, with that, it was just like a buttload of experience I got um, being thrust into that situation. Plus with that background from my parents, it really put me in a good position. So UTech at that time, it was like 2015. We started in 2012. I was the 10th employee and we didn't do a ton of digital marketing. We did some, but mainly we were like a web design company. And given that I was in this role where I was doing all these things that we didn't have teams for, that set me up where there was a clear growth path into the marketing side for all these other clients who we build websites for and then they want digital marketing services. So I just got to start experimenting with more clients. I was promoted. Um, I became director of content. After that, I was our director of search, then VP of marketing, and then CMO as we've grown. And um, you know, today we've got about 60 employees through two locations. Wow. I'm in Naperville. Uh, our other office is in Scottsdale, Arizona. Hopefully in 2021, we're going to open an office in Dallas. But, you know, COVID and all that, we'll see what happens. But it's been a journey, man. It's been a trip. I do love my job. I'm super passionate about marketing, almost to a fault. I'm a super nerd, but I love it, man. It's great. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, you really got to grow with like one company, basically. You got to see it go from what you said, 10 to 60 employees. It's yeah, a big jump. Yeah. Um, so as project manager for that one client, you said you basically did everything. Was there anything in particular that you went in you went into completely blind? I know you said there's some things you've never done before, it's kind of a crash yeah. course, but anything that was that like really threw you for a loop, anything that you really struggled with? Yeah, I will say so. I'm you know, I was writing content every day. So it was I'll give you a little bit more background. It's a Chicago entertainment website. Okay. And the ultimate goal of the site, I'll be honest with you, I, I kind of just like straight up failed in my objective, but then it worked out. So I, my goal was to, we were doing this for a parking company, Inner Park, they work in Chicago. 
Okay. Um, they're, they're like all over the place, actually. They're national, they're international. But the goal was they've, they've got these people coming into their space, like Spot Hero Park Wiz, you probably heard of them. There's these parking apps mm-hmm. in big cities. It's hard to find parking. So these apps will allow you to book a space online in a parking garage. Now, the people who own the garages, who I was working for, the, I mean, they love that because it fills up the empty spots that no one's in, but then they have to give a cut to these apps. And right. the apps usually don't charge that much, so they're losing money there. So what they wanted to do was sell parking online for themselves. Got and it. And the goal was I, we would use an inbound marketing strategy, talk about events happening in Chicago, and then have like CTAs of where to buy parking for these events. Ultimately, that failed. I mean, we, we couldn't. I mean, those apps have grown huge. They had like so much budget, you know, and I couldn't generate enough marketing to offset anything that they were doing. They're, they just grew like way beyond. So what we ended up doing is shifting that to a media site that, you know, runs ads, does sponsored articles and everything. And now, you know, we're, we're in a much better position that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I ultimately failed at that goal. I found that search ads, were really not the thing to do for a media mm-hmm. site at all. Uh, and I found that social media, you know, over time has, has changed. When it was 2015 and I just started writing these articles and we had zero followers on Facebook and everything, it was really easy to grow that audience. I'd post something, people would see it. I'd get shares. It'd be great. Right. And, you know, we grew that to about 50,000. And then Facebook just, you know, really stagnated itself over the years as it became more congested and everything. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, you know, there were some great victories along the way. And I know you didn't ask me this, but I want to tell no, you. No, no. Yeah, it's cool. okay. Yeah. So some great victories along the way, like I said, Chicago based media site. So when um, the Blackhawks in 2015 were on their way to the Stanley Cup, I actually had an article ready to go about where the parade was going to be the championship parade when they mm-hmm. won. And I didn't actually know where the parade was going to be. But they won the Stanley Cup. I posted on all of our social channels right away that right. you know this is where the parade's going to be and in the article i basically just said tbd we don't know yet right and, but so many people shared out our article and everything it ended up going viral and wow. I, I essentially said like check back in a bit and we'll have the info i found a dude who had the tweet had the info i put the tweet in the article mm-hmm. and then boom i mean we we crashed our servers we had hundreds of thousands of hits in uh wow. like an hour I, literally you couldn't get on the website at all we were not prepared for it but that kicked things up, like jump started everything. And then we did it again when the Cubs won the World Series in 2016. So, so is that like your new strategy then? I mean, that's talk about like <laughs> accidental victory, right? Like you couldn't have planned that. No, I didn't think it would be anywhere near what it was. I mean, right. it, it was, yeah, I, I, I was, I was hopeful that it was going to be a good strategy, mm-hmm. but to see it blow up the way that it did and crash the site. I mean, I was, I was absolutely ecstatic. You know? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Is there, have you, I mean, to me, that like falls in, I guess, the bucket of experimental marketing in a way, right? Like you're really just kind of guessing. Has there been anything else that you've done that would fall into the, the same category of kind of like experimental? Hmm. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about super risky. I mean, there was some other stuff we had done with that client where, uh, you know, I posted some stuff on Reddit that initially kind of kicked us off too. Okay. And that was just totally experimental. I mean, Reddit's a hard place to market yourself. I, I was just it's, having this conversation. Reddit is like yeah. the wild west basically, right? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of brands want to try to find a way to tap into that market, but I think they have, I wouldn't say the meanest, but probably the toughest audience. You know, people can kind of smell an ad from a yeah. mile away on there. Yeah. They don't want to be sold anything. I had been shadow banned multiple times before <laughs> I got anything to work because, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I was, uh, hey, here's my new article. Here's my new article. And like mm-hmm. some people just tore me down too. Like I sure. wrote an article and they were like, what is this, BuzzFeed? Oh, this is terrible. And I was like, right. oh, man, I thought that was yeah. good. But, uh, you know, I, it, it ultimately, you know, I just kept trying and trying anything because this was like in our infantile stages. And I had wrote an article about, I don't know why everything that worked was related to sports, but it was. Mm-hmm. The NFL draft was being held in Chicago that year. And so I wrote an article about all the information I could compile from all these different sources about the draft because they were doing something new and mm-hmm. nobody really had any information. Like you could go to the NFL site and there wasn't a ton of stuff. I had to like look for sports writers and all their like tweets and reports on things. And I just compiled everything. 
And I posted on Reddit and I was like super unassuming, like, hey, I know I'm linking back to my own site, but I promise you this is valuable. You can't find this anywhere else. You know, mm-hmm. here's all the stuff I've been able to compile. Here's like a map of the area. Here's all this stuff. And and that was a, a success. I think I got like 4,500 upvotes. Wow. Which is, which is for, pretty substantial. For, for Reddit. Reddit, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we got some pretty good site traffic, email subscribers and stuff from that too. But awesome. it's, a, it's a challenge, man. Like you said, Reddit is not a place for the faint of heart. And uh, no, you got to have, you you gotta have thick skin. I know you said before that you were an English major, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then one of your jobs at UTech was content manager. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that that really helped you being an English major kind of helped shape the content that you're able to put out? Did it make you a stronger copywriter? Um, how did that affect the content that you made at UTech? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a really good, and then philosophy too is what I transitioned into and that I, the, between the two, man, I mean, writing to me is an exceptionally powerful tool. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can design the prettiest stuff, but words are what sell people at the end of the day. It's words. And, um, you know, copywriting is something I've always seen as a strong suit of mine. And it's probably just because of my background. But um, absolutely, I think I have some great copywriting tips if you want me to go down that road too. But um, yeah, it, it was. It, it, at, at copywriting is at the core of everything we do here. If you don't have the words right, you're not going to like be able to run ads well. You're not going to be able to uh, get people's attention in the beginning with what they're doing. You know, you've got to have great headlines. You've got to have like short, choppy copy. I saw that from Dave Gerhardt. But um, so, yeah, man, I, I love I love that kind of stuff. It's always fueled me, and I, I still today keep a very very close tie to the the content team here and our copywriting team here for that reason because I I think it just fuels everything, and it's important that they know that they're important too because there aren't a ton of metrics that come back to the copywriting team as like hey you're doing a good job because the analytics say so like right. that's the ad team who's seeing all that so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it all, it all ties together. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. And so is Dave Gerhardt, right? Like that choppy copy is, it seems to be effective and it's super modern right now. You see a lot of, a lot of brands kind of using this, this form of, of headlines, um, copy in their ads, just mm-hmm. really space it out. So you read each thing, everything punches and has meaning. Um, you know, if I were to put out a Facebook ad right now, um, and I don't really know my audience super well. What are some good things to try to figure out like who I'm speaking to. Yeah, I I would say, well, if you don't know your audience, one of the Mm -hmm. things you're going to want to do is test various different things, right? You're going to want to see what resonates with them. But I would say focus on the benefits over the features of your product. And I know that sounds kind of basic and it's Mm -hmm. like marketing 101, but a lot of people don't do it. They'll be like, oh, like a a good example of this. Um, Steve Jobs, when he was first with Apple, like 1979 or something, Mm -hmm. He took out a seven page ad in like the New York times, wall street journal, one of those publications explaining all the technical specifications of the new Mac that he had created. And it, as you might imagine, Mm -hmm. seven pages of technical specs, like what are you doing, Steve jobs? Right. He then left the company like years later, went to work at Pixar for a while and learned the art of storytelling. And he came back. And I mean, if you look at like those early ads for the iPod and stuff, it doesn't say the world's first MP3 player. Like that's, that's a feature. That's what it is. That's factually what an iPod like kind of was. Mm-hmm. Instead, it says 10,000 songs in your pocket. Right. That's the benefit, right? Like yeah. you have that on you if you buy this. Mm-hmm. And it's like, damn, okay, well, I can look cool. And if you think about all Apple's marketing, like they appeal to a certain person, right? And so I think, I think Apple's a company that nails this, like benefits over features, but... Um, at the end of the day, it's super easy to just write about like, you know, my, my mouse is white and it's, it's mm-hmm. very ergonomical and blah, blah, blah. But like, what is it actually going to make you feel? And how can you even tie that back to, you know, primal things, primal nature of humans and what we um, need for survival. And then that's like step two is, is like, you know, social hierarchy, right? Like everyone wants mm-hmm. to be higher in the social hierarchy. That's just natural. That's innate. So if you can make someone look knowledgeable in front of their friends, that's, that's a plus. And that's, I've seen like great copy from the wall street journal that nails that it says like impress all your friends. Like right. everyone wants to impress their friends. That's cool. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, um, 
you know, things about status, our grades, like things about even like shelter or safety, like a lot of brands, depending on what you sell, can play into that. And the negative aspect can often be more motivating than the positive too. Like if you had a hundred dollars and I said to you, like, I'm going to take your hundred dollars. You're going to be like, what the hell? Like you'd be super pissed at me. But if I was like, you can win this hundred dollars. You're like, well, what's at stake? Like, what do I got to do? I don't know if I want to win a hundred dollars. Do I got to give you my email? Like, uh, I don't know. So right. I, I think there are a lot of things that go into it, but at the end of the day, benefits versus features is a great step. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of times you see, you know, small businesses when they first do their copy, do the opposite, right? What you're saying, talking about really the features over the benefits. And I think a lot of times because they have their hand, obviously in creating this product, they're so like in the weeds about it. And they're so, yeah. you know, they want to show off like all the cool different features about it, you know, and really talk about, you know, the technical stuff. It's not about you either. Like, and, and that's very hard. I think for people to understand is like, you don't want to be the main character in what you're doing. You want the person on the other side to be the main character and you're helping them get from point A to point B. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not about you, even though you've experienced your whole life from the first person and like you see your brand as like you and you want to talk about you and how great you are, you need to talk about them because they, they see themselves the same way. So how can you help them get from A to B? Like you're the guy who does that. You bridge the gap. You're not the main character in the story. So yeah, absolutely. Focus on that. But it's so much easier said than done. A lot of people like seem to screw up that step before anything else. And until you can really figure that out and figure out that voice, you're going to run into problems. You're going to be running into problems with, like you said, your, your content you put out, the copy you do. Um, and at that point, you're putting, throwing money away by putting out these ads that just aren't working. Yeah. So yeah, I think before you have any sort of marketing plan, before you put any budget into your ads, yeah, really focus on the customer. You now are CMO. What does your day-to-day -day look like as CMO, right? Like how big is your yeah. team? How many things are you overseeing? Is there any part of your job that you think you are more hands-on in as opposed to more over oversight and kind of leaving it to someone else? Yeah, great question. So I'm, I'm chief marketing officer. I have a VP of marketing underneath me as well. He focuses on a lot of like the day-to-day -day stuff. We we always make this joke like we're big office fans. Oh, uh, Michael, like, Michael and Jim. Day-to-day, -day, yeah. you know, big picture. Yeah, that's yeah. we always make that joke. So he's he's very like day-to-day, hands-on with with various things that are going on. And then I'm more like head in the clouds, big picture kind of stuff. But really our marketing here is comprised of three separate teams, kind of four. We're it, it keeps segmenting out as we grow bigger. But we've got our, our paid ads team, which now is sort of like search ads. And that's like been compartmentalized into one. We've got paid social media, which has grown to be big enough as, as its own department. It used to be combined with, it was just all paid ads in one. Mm -hmm. um, we've got our SEO team, which is uh, probably our largest team. And then we've got our content team, which is, is comprised of social media, uh, multimedia as well, like video, photography, and copyright. Got it. So, that's really our hierarchy. And then my day to day is and the team that I'm most ingrained with is the content team. I, I oversee them. We don't have a director of that team right now. We've got directors of all the other teams. So I kind of step into that role and work with our content manager a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I, and I mean, our content team's great. It's like our fastest growing team, but my day to day is really, you know, trying to market UTech, but also marketing our clients to and yeah. providing that overall strategy as an agency of like, where should these things go for our bigger clients? So I'm putting together quarterly plans for our clients. I'm putting together quarterly plans for UTAC. I will get a lot of initiatives started. Like I'll come in with a lot of ideas. I'll relate them to business goals for the client or for UTAC. And then I kind of see them the last 10, 15% of the way too, to make sure that they're all polished up and ready to go once they're, once they're ready. So gotcha. um, that's, that's a lot of what I do, I'd say. And then podcasting. Right. And then podcasting, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like a little fun side thing, right? It's kind of yeah. like, yeah, it's more relaxing maybe. Um, so those four departments you talked about, right? You got, remind me again, paid social, you have content, you have SEO. And paid search. And paid search. Yep. Um, is there, which one of those would you say requires the most attention? 
to mm. a successful, because all of those things essentially come together for an amazing marketing campaign, right? Mm. A, a plan, a vision, um, what, what requires the most attention, um, the one that can fall off the tracks the easiest? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And generally speaking, my answer would probably be a little bit different if we grew all the departments evenly at the same time, but certain departments came around later than others and they need more structure mm. and setup. Okay. So given that, you know, that, that might change my answer a bit, but if I was looking at it objectively, like all the departments are on the same level, you know, they're all, they've all grown at the same capacity. Everything's good. Like the structure's in place. I would say the one to look at the most is the page search side. And my reason for that is because that's usually where your largest budgets are going. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when there, whenever there's money involved and like people can see you spent this much money, you got this back and it, you, you got to like be on it at all yeah, times. You better and, have an answer. Yeah. 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 And then there's other departments that just aren't like that, you know, like SEO is not like that. People understand that it's a long-term play. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not something where there's like fires in SEO. Like, right. you know, th that doesn't happen. There's no fire in copywriting world. It's just like, Hey, rewrite this, you know, no big deal. But on the, on the paid search side, if there was ever an issue with like tracking or attribution, you know, that could, that could spell huge problems if, if not snuffed out right away. So definitely there. Where do you find inspiration? Um, I wouldn't say motivation, maybe like energy, right? Like what, where do you look to for inspiration to create content? I mean, it's so easy to kind of like hit that wall and just be like, we're really running out of ideas here. You can really like, yeah. it really dries out fast. Um, so what, what do you do if you ever like run into that problem? Yeah. So for us, I mean, we're, we're B2B, right. And I, I follow a lot of B2B marketers, just generally speaking on like mm -hmm. LinkedIn, I try to interact with people on Twitter, the same, but truthfully, I'm getting a lot of myself lately from podcast guests. Okay. I, they bring great stuff to the table. So that's, that's definitely like one way for sure. But, you know, I subscribe to a few email newsletters I like here and there nothing crazy. I'm in Dave Gerhardt's marketing group, which I recommend. It's, it's $10 mm -hmm. a month, but right. I'm telling you the people in there, it's not even Dave Gerhardt. It's like the Facebook community and the exclusive access you get to those people. They're awesome. You can ask for a template on how to like create a uh, marketing plan. And these people are just like, yeah, here's a template, here's a template, here's a template. And you're like, oh my God, this would have taken me like an hour to create this. And boom. Right. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. I, I've heard good things. Very great. Very yeah. great. Uh, very great. Um, but yeah, I've, I've interacted now with so many great people who are just brilliant minds and I follow all them. So I would say that's where I get it. Got it. So it's really like looking more to individuals than companies and their plans. It's really about how certain people market things. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there are, there are companies that are definitely model companies as well, for sure. But in today's day and age, like, you know, I even saw this was from, um, the head of Ahrefs, the SEO software, he did an experiment where he posted the exact same things on social media from his personal account and his brand account every day for like a month. Right. And you just look at it and it's like, people follow people, you know? And I gravitate towards people too. I just, I just do. I like the, the person behind the mask and um, that's, that's where I'm always at. I like to hear what they're doing. I like to hear the tactics behind it. I like to hear, you know, their exact strategy, like who they're hiring, what their department structure is like, how they're doing all that stuff so that I, I can just have all those different viewpoints to be able to do those kind of things myself. And then I like to just hear all those different viewpoints to construct my own view too, right? And then relate right. that to personal experiences. And, and that's where I come from. And I'm, I'm generally just an energetic person. You probably hear it talking to me. Yeah. I'm, I'm passionate, you know, so I, that helps. kind of stuff motivates me. I love, I love learning, man. Yeah. And, um, oh, you know what? I, I've been reading some books too. I started okay. reading books in 2020 and yeah. I've gotten a ton of stuff from books, man. Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. Okay. Absolutely excellent. Highly recommended. Books are, books are awesome. Any, any other books that you've read recently that have, you know, really helped motivate you? Uh, that one, that one was like, I think I've said the word groundbreaking three times on your podcast today, but that right. one was groundbreaking. Groundbreaking. Was okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, that one I really liked. I also read the e-commerce marketing handbook, which was really, really good for like specific playbooks to do that's, various different things. That's privies, right? Isn't that? That's privies. Okay. Yeah. It was, I mean, it's, it's, 
it's almost like a 101, 102 level type thing. Like it's mm-hmm. not anything crazy, but it's very tactical. It's like if you want to send out uh, abandoned cart emails, here's the exact play by play that works for like thousands of e commerce businesses. Boom. Wow. You know, things like that. So I, I really liked that. And then I just started with, uh, oh man, I forgot the name of the book. Damn, I forgot. I don't know. That's okay. Another one though, and it's really good. It's okay. Email <laughs> to me and I'll, I'll throw it in there too, but I'll, okay, I'll make cool. sure to add a note in the video. Is there anything that you have, that you tried doing that you're like, this is not going to work, but it took off, which I think you kind of answered before, right? With that, the viral sure. um, post, right? Um, so you don't have to touch on that, but the other thing I'd love to know, is there anything that you were super excited about, like really stoked about, and then it just did not work out? Yes. Oh yeah. I got a good one. Okay. Yeah. So we, um, we, I mean, I told you about all those other channels and they're very competitive and stuff. And that's very Mm -hmm. true. I wouldn't say we like bombed entirely in those, but I had this, this idea that I thought was super cool where we were going to get these custom made wine bottles and we were going to send them out to um, all of our clients and ask for referrals. And we thought of this super creative name. It was like, oh man, I don't even remember the name. I just threw out the, I just threw out the wine bottle today. Too. So it's sitting here. It's a wine. But, so on the label, on yeah. the label. It, oh, it was called Letter of Recommendation. We we wrote Letter of Recommendation on the label, okay. and we went to our clients' offices. And we delivered this and we essentially asked them for referrals. And we okay. had this idea to have these like beautiful cards and it was going to come from like the sales guy and our project manager was going to deliver them in tandem. And it was this so, beautiful idea. So it's kind of yeah. like talking about the office again, kind of like how they would have those, remember those, the gift baskets and the turtles? The gift basket? Yeah. It's okay. pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. Right. It was, it was okay. Similar idea. Um, but, you know, it was, we thought it was creative. I thought it was creative. It was my idea. Mm-hmm. And the execution, I think, was like a little bit botched. I didn't totally follow through to make sure that it it got executed on the way that I wanted. And in some cases, like, you know, we just gave the client a bottle of water or wine, didn't say anything, didn't ask for a referral. In okay. some cases, we didn't even deliver them to some clients. In some cases, you know, it was like a handwritten scribbled note, just mm-hmm. like saying thank you. So it, the entire like purpose of it did mm-hmm. not get followed through on at all. And we essentially just gave our clients wine bottles. And it was like, right. There you go. We didn't get but, any new business out of it. But that's an incredibly unique idea. You know, I've never heard of anyone doing that, but I think that's, I mean, it might be worth revisiting. I think it's just kind of like yeah. making sure it follows through, right? It might be hard for me to get by and internally to do it again. And do it again, yeah. <laughs> like, I know I brought this up, but give me one more chance with the wine. It's like, if someone hears enough. this and you yeah. execute on it and it works well, please let me know. I am all for it. I really want the idea to work. <laughs> um, I think that kind of wraps it up again, Michael, thank you so much for your time. You know, thanks for being the first video guest we have. Um, you've been super helpful through all this. I've definitely learned a lot. Do you have any last minute shout outs, anything you want to promote, sure. anything you want to say? Yeah. So if, if you're at all interested in UTAC, uh, check us out, utacagency.com. That's Y O U T E C H agency.com. I also have a podcast. It's called You Talk, similar to You Tech, but it's You Talk. You can find that right on our website. It's just under podcast. Check it out. You can listen to great people like Derek here. I had him on the other day and we're, we're growing, we're expanding. It's fun. It's good stuff. Great. And just a reminder, I will link everything in the caption below. So I'll make sure to put the website, you know, link to the podcast. Um, but yeah, I think that wraps it up. Michael, awesome. thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, man. I had a great time. This was a blast. All right. Bye. For more episodes, including our webinar replays, please visit our Spotify and Apple Music pages. Thanks.